You and three friends are given a cake to share and divide amongst yourselves. While contemplating the best way to distribute the cake, John says, let's play four rounds of Super Smash Bros and the winner of each round will get one portion. The game ensues and John, who is secretly a competitive Super Smash Bros player, wins three quarters of the cake, leaving the final quarter for the three of you casual gamers to fight over. How can we make this fair? Some would say John should give some of his two thirds to the rest of you. Some would say John should only be able to choose between a few weaker characters so the skill gap shrinks. This is the difference between redistribution and pre-distribution. Redistribution aims at equalizing unfair market outcomes through measures such as taxation, where the more advantaged members of society are taxed by the state, who then uses those funds to fund transfer payments and to provide public services. Pre-distribution, however, focuses on restructuring the economy in a way that reduces the difference in power between the more and less advantage. Political scientists Evelyn Huber and John Stevens say that while redistribution is to repair, pre-distribution is to prepare. The latter involves distributing marketable skills more equally to reduce inequality with early measures like investing in early childhood education, in vocational education, and in adult labor market training. It also involves a paradigm shift in assessing merit through a wider and more inclusive criteria which would otherwise prefer those born in better socio-economic conditions. These investments affect income distribution by increasing the quality of labor at the bottom of the distribution. Now that we understand how redistribution and pre-distribution are different, we should ask ourselves, is one better than the other? Proponents of pre-distribution come up with three points to argue for why it is better than redistribution. Addressing economic inequality at its core, redistributive backlash, and a greater relational equality amongst people. Pre-distribution proponents Hacker and O'Neill claim that pre-distribution aims to dismantle the more deep-seated structures of how the economy perpetuates inequality. This is in contrast to redistribution which fails to address this because of the inequality, only attempting to mitigate inequality after it disappears due to the structures of the economy. The first structural feature of the market that causes economic inequality is that the rate of return on capital is greater than the growth in income. This makes capital play a far bigger role than income in accumulating wealth, implying that a greater portion of a state's gross domestic product goes towards those holding capital. This leads to an exponentially growing increase in wealth for these groups while those with less capital are left further and further behind, thus causing the economic inequality in question. Pre-distributive policies attempt to either decrease the rate of return on capital, increase the rate of growth of income, or both to reduce the impact of this differential inequality. The second structural feature of the market that causes economic inequality is that those with greater capital also wield more economic, social, and political power. They are thus more able to maneuver and manipulate the economy and political landscape to their advantage through setting the conditions or enacting certain barriers to resources and opportunities. This has resulting outcomes in how resources, opportunities, wealth are being distributed, thus compounding the inequalities in question. Pre-distributive policies such as strengthening meritocracy or empowering worker unions directly tackle this imbalance in power instead of mitigating the resulting fiscal effects of said imbalance. Imagine the core of the problem is that the rate of improvement in John's skills at Super Smash Bros is greater than the rate of improvement for the three of you. This results in John having a higher winning rate, which just keeps exponentially increasing. 
pre-distributive solutions attempt to either decrease the rate of improvement of John, increase the rate of improvement for the three of you, or both to reduce the differential inequality. But what if John's exponentially increasing rate of improvement wasn't the only problem? What if the winner of each game was also additionally able to alter the rules for the next game? They would of course alter it such that it gives them an advantage, which just lets them keep up their winning streak. So, another pre-distributive policy is to prevent John from having disproportionate influence over the three of you due to his higher winning rate. Hacker and O'Neill also claim that redistributive policies have more potential than pre-distributive policies to be regarded as unfair as this backlash can be counterproductive, undermining support for progressive politics aimed at equality. This is explained by the concept of loss aversion where the people feel a sense of ownership or a right to things already under their possession. It is this aversion that results in a greater resistance when having these things taken away from them. Redistribution lends itself precisely to this problem, given that it seems to take away someone's wealth after they have already come to possess it. If equality is associated with these seemingly unjust retributive policies, then those who are the more disadvantaged by these policies may resultantly be turned against equality altogether. When one considers that those who would be most disadvantaged by redistributive policies are precisely those who currently hold the most wealth and consequently have the most economic, social and political power, the significance of this potential troubling outcome compounds. However, one should also note this possibility in pre-distributive policies. This is because people may already have certain preconceived notions on what constitutes a just basis for distribution. Take affirmative action policies in universities and workplaces for example. A common sentiment that opposes affirmative action arises from the perception of a strict meritocracy being the just basis of distribution of opportunity. Imagine if John was only allowed to play in and hence win one of the four rounds of Super Smash Bros. Surely he will feel singled out by an unjust rule that he will most definitely protest against. In such a case, Predistributive policies might lend themselves to a similar backlash that redistributive policies face as well. The last advantage that predistribution is purported to have over redistribution is that the former works toward a greater relational equality, whereas redistribution works against it. But first, what is relational equality? Writer and economist Richard Reeves defines it as being treated equally by our fellows. He says that relational equality is based necessarily on respect, both for oneself and in the eyes of others. This is why healthy relationships are reliant on respect and being disrespected is socially painful. So, how does pre-distribution work toward relational equality and redistribution against it? Pre-distributive policies changes how wealth, resources, and opportunities are distributed before they reach the hands or pockets of individuals. These policies aim at better equipping individuals at earning their keep than simply redistributing what is earned from the more advantaged to the less advantaged. Imagine how John would feel if for every portion of cake he wins, he has to give the rest of you one bite from that portion of cake. Take that in contrast to the case where the game is held off for a while and the three of you are given an intensive Super Smash Bros training camp. If in both scenarios John ends up with the same amount of cake, it seems quite possible that he would see the three of you as properly earning your share of the cake and therefore his equal if his cake wasn't taken but won by you. So. Should we discard redistributive policies to make way for pre-distributive ones? The answer is no, we shouldn't. In the many examples raised so far, we see how many measures under each school of thought are neither mutually exclusive nor substitutes. 
In fact, they can many a time be quite complimentary. Maybe if the three of you had some time to train with Super Smash Bros. professionals. Maybe if John gave away one bite per portion of cake he wins. Then we could see how pre-distribution and redistribution could complement each other to give the four of you a truly equitable distribution of cake.